And yeah. So this is 10 cool things you can do with Azure Databricks. As we said, a bit of a tour de force of there's just 10, 11 demos that we put together just to say, hey, we think this is cool. We think this makes a change to actually how you're working. These might be features that you know, might be features that you don't know, and hopefully trying to do the, make you leave the room going, ah, I didn't know you could do that. That's cool. That's kind of what we're after. Um, so normal stuff, silent cell phones, explore pass, and ourselves. Quick intro. Uh, yeah, my name is Ike Ellis, and um, I speak a lot uh, in this community and in other communities. Um, I'm from San Diego, California, where I own a software company called Crafting Bytes. We do projects for other people, and we also do a lot of uh, data engineering and data pipeline work for a lot of companies um, uh, around the US, mostly in the Southwest, but around the world, actually. Yeah. I'm Dustin Vanoy. I'm also in San Diego, working with Ike on some of his cool projects, working on some of my own. Uh, I'm a data engineering consultant now, uh, leading, uh, co-leading the data engineering group in San Diego. So if you're ever in town on the first Thursday of the month, come hang out with us. And uh, yeah, just interested in all kinds of modern data, cloud-based data engineering stuff. So Databricks has, has been a major focus of, for me for a while now. And Simon Whiteley. Hello. I'm not around that area. I am from London in the UK, if that wasn't immediately obvious. Um, and I uh, run a small consultancy doing advanced analytics. I spend my life playing around with cloud and Databricks and Secret Data Warehouse, Data Factory, all that kind of modern tech stack, doing engineering-y type things. Cool. Oh, and we'll be tweeting, one of us, all of us, will be tweeting out the notebooks. So all the demos that we're showing you today, we're going to bundle it up, tweet it out. So if you follow at least one of us on Twitter, you should see that later. And not only that, but we hung out last night for a few hours, and we agreed that we're going to be making videos of what you see today on YouTube. And we're going to create one giant playlist of this session with each of us doing our demo. And then we'll tweet out that playlist on YouTube also. So you can yeah. see it. But that might not be this week. It might, be, <laughs> might take us a little bit to do that. I need to get back to the right country first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so this is our playlist of demos. So bear with us. We're going to be chopping and changing between people's PCs. Hopefully, it won't be that onerous. Um, and things we're going to do. So having a look at Markdown, how you can document your code better, because we like documentation. Yeah. No? So you want me to start? Not uh, yet. Oh, no, no. Oh. You do you want to do, no, no, do everyone no, thing? I've no, got some data mixed things first. Yeah, See, slick understand. rehearsal. We're all over this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so these are things we're looking at. Using it externally, what if you don't want to code in the cloud? What if you want to stream data, how that works, how that fits in? What if you want to use Data Factory? How you want to schedule with that stuff? I've made a list, just so we've got that run out of. <laughs> How you do things securely, because security is cool. We think so. How you use a thing called MLflow. Any data scientists in the room? You got a few? I'll show you what MLflow, how you track your models, track your experiments. We'll have a look at bulk loading data into SQL DB. We'll be looking at Databricks Delta, which is how you add acid transactions, how you actually make it behave a little bit more like a consistent database, even though it's in a lake. Um, we're making Parquet efficient, because Parquet is awesome. We'll be having a look at Power BI. So how you can link Power BI to Databricks and get those talking to each other. And then one is you want to chuck away Power BI and just have dashboards inside Databricks. We'll show you that. That's our plan. Sound cool? Good. We'll see how this goes. We've never done this session before, if that wasn't obvious. So a quick overview of Databricks. What Databricks actually is, it says it's fancy Spark. It's Spark made by the guys who wrote Spark basically put an implementation layer over the top. Spark used to be quite hard to do. You had to install a load of things. You had to manually configure a ton of things. Spark's not new. It's been around for an age. Databricks is just making it accessible, making it, I want to click one button, and then suddenly I've got a Spark cluster that I didn't have to go and set up. It's the point of Databricks. So a few things, a little potted history. Got a, qu got a question if you Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like yes. Uh, what's so what's the difference between HD Insight and Databricks? And it's a good question, because you have been able to do Spark in Azure for an age by having HD Insight. A uh, couple of differences. HD Insight, you have to manually install lots of different components. It's quite tricky to set up. It takes a lot of configuring to do it. And when you deploy HD Insight, that is your server deployed, costing you money. 
when you want to stop it, you have to delete it and then redeploy it. There's a whole load of infrastructure management pain. And it's doing the same thing. It's still Spark. It just removes all of that pain. It's kind of like the equivalent of making it platform as a service versus it being infrastructure. It's kind of what we're doing. OK, so back in the day, Google came out with a thing called GFS, the Google File System. And that is the heart of saying, rather than having one server with a disk with a ton of data, I just have to read that disk. And then that gives me I.O. problems. I have to work out how do I actually make that go faster. GFS came out and said, well, actually, why don't I take my data and just make lots and lots of copies of it? Why don't I take a single file and just cut that up into two chunks and spread it across a load of different disks? And then once you've got distributed data, you went, well, why don't we do distributed compute? So actually have that server query that small bit of data, that query server do that small bit of data, and just span it out. So if my data's going really slowly, rather than saying, I need to go and buy a whole new bigger server with more and more cores, more RAM, actually just add on a, small, a few small cheat boxes. That kind of became the thing we know and love, Hadoop, the original MapReduce. And that has a load of disk read-write involved. I'm still touching the disk a hell of a lot back and forth and trying to do anything. So as a response to that, so Matei, Zaria, a few of his colleagues over in uh, UC Berkeley uh, came up with this thing called Spark. So Spark is that same concept. We're talking about distributed data. We're talking about distributed compute, but I'm doing it in memory. So I'm keeping things in memory shared across a load of boxes, and suddenly everything goes a lot faster. That's kind of where Spark is coming from. They donated it, became this open source project, Apache Spark. And then the guys who invented it all went off, founded a company called Databricks. So Databricks, again, the guys who invented Spark started the company. So generally, Databricks has the most up-to-date runtime for Spark because it's the guys who are putting the most stuff into the code base of pumping it into their own product, unsurprisingly. So the kind of things that we're talking about is I've got some data that's distributed on my disk. I've got a Spark cluster. Everything we're talking about is parallelism. So I've got a driver node doing the thinking, and I've got several different workers. So whenever I'm trying to do work, write a bit of Python, tell the driver what I want it to do. That passes work down into the worker nodes. Each worker can then go and individually access data. I can scale out and do lots of things in parallel. It'll suck the data up onto those worker nodes, and they each do their own bit of work in, in isolation. And then they can chuck their results together and throw it back to the node. That's all the kind of jobs we're trying to do is trying to say, I want things to run in parallel. I want things to scale out. If that's going slowly, I just want to change configuration and go, you know, next time, run it with eight nodes. Just be able to really quickly and dynamically scale up and down to do this kind of stuff. That's, in a nutshell, what Databricks is. Uh, just to add to that, the, the brilliant part of this technology is that the code doesn't know that it's scaling across multiple servers. So when you write code in Databricks, you're just writing regular code that kind of looks like SQL code. It doesn't know that there's eight nodes under there. It doesn't know there's two. It doesn't know there's 16, right? And if you, you can scale separately without the code changing. And that's kind of the secret. Yeah. Um, so there's a few other bits and pieces that I've got on top of just that pure Spark engine sat inside it. You've got the whole workspace, so the notebooks and its ability to manage clusters. That is all Databricks stuff. So this is all the implementation management things that put in. You've got a thing called Delta Lake, which is a product they've open sourced. But inside Databricks, they've got a slightly fancier premium version of it. You've got MLflow. Again, they've open sourced it. They've shared it with the world. There's a slightly fancier version of it inside Databricks. It tends to be the, thing, the way that they work. They share the core base, but they keep, if you want to pay our license fee, you can get extras, you can get more features, you get a richer experience. That's kind of what Databricks is for us, is that management layer. So we'll be going in this thing, the Databricks workspace, and that's where we can create clusters, we can store all our code. So we have a whole dedicated area for interacting with various different Spark clusters. That's one of the first things to get your head around is the fact that Databricks isn't just one bit of compute that you provision. It's not like SQL DB where I put out my database and I have to pick, pick how big it is. I deploy a workspace, and inside there, I can define lots of different clusters. I only pay for it when I've got a cluster turned on, so I can kind of manage my workload, manage my scale, all quite independently from my code. So I run this bit of code on that cluster, actually run it on that bigger cluster, and it gives me a lot of flexibility. It's all about elastic scale. Cool. First demo. First demo. Okay, so I'm gonna let's do our first time switching over and see.
Can you guys see my screen? OK. So for those of you who don't know what a notebook is, um, this is just a mixture of code and documentation. And one of the cool things about the notebook, and don't get caught up in the code right now, is that you can have code, and then right in the same cell, you get the results for the execution. So that means that what you're able to do in a notebook that you can't do in SQL Server Management Studio is you can tell a story. You can say, I want to know some information. There it is. And then that's fixed. That's in the notebook until you clear it and run it again. So you can kind of keep track of what code you wrote and the results of that code as it evolves throughout the story. My wife is a data scientist. Um, she was running code in our studio. And she was writing down the answer in a notebook. And then she was taking a picture with a camera like of her a real code. No, a real notebook. Yeah, a paper. real notebook. She was <laughs> writing down with a piece of paper. She was writing down the answer. And then she would take a, a picture with her camera of the code. And I said, baby, what are you doing? And she said, well, I want to know which code gave me that answer so that if I change it, I can revert back to it if I need to. And I said, wow, you're just pretty smart. You just created the most fucked up source control <laughs> I've ever seen. Uh, uh, so, so um, <laughs> still married, yeah, still married, right. So you can see that in addition to your code and the results, you can also add text here. And so you can say, hey, there be dragons under here, or pay attention to this thing that's happening right now. So for, and the way you can do that, by the way, is you can just write text. Like I can just say, if I want a brand new uh, text window, I can just start typing text here. But I don't have to write text. I can also use Markdown. Now, for those of you who don't know what Markdown is, it's like a very simple form of HTML that's easy to read that anybody can write. And Markdown is universal. It's not just in the notebooks. It's in GitHub. It's how we create GitHub documentation. It's Visual Studio Code we will use Markdown if we want to create um, documentation in our software projects and things like that. And so if I wanted to say, like, create a list, I could just say percent MD, and then I just make an asterisk. And with the asterisk is a Markdown syntax. I'm not making this up. I can just say list item one, right? And then another asterisk, list item two. And then what happens with that is it formats it like a list, like HTML, without actually all the HTML ceremony and irritant around it, right? So for instance, if I, could, if I wanted to say, like, hey, I want a big header. So my big header is going to be reasons why San Diego is better than London. <laughs> Right? And we could say, like, like here, here's a list of, you know, sunshine, weather. Sunshine. Yeah, yeah. sunshine, <laughs> right? What? Right? Year round surfing and golf, right? Um, we should probably stop. We don't want to make well, it feel bad. I mean, we could just say. <laughs> as long as you don't mention Brexit, we're fine. <laughs> just coffee, right? So, so now you can see that that little pound symbol gave me a really big header, and then the little um, asterisk gave me some bullets, right? Well, Markdown is very nice. Like, this is a table. And the syntax to create a table is pretty simple, wouldn't you say? And if you want more, and we told you we were going to give you this demo um, in GitHub, you know, we're going to release this to you, uh, you'll see these links when you get that. And these links will give you Markdown syntax help so that if you don't know Markdown, you can learn it. Markdown is a good skill to have. Like I said, you'll use it in GitHub and Visual Studio Code. And more places, people are just like, there's Markdown if you want to do some documentation. So I think it's a valuable thing for you to take a look at and learn. Now, in addition, you'll, do you see the little T here, the little orange T? That tells me that Dustin is in my thing here. He's like, in, he's, he's like wants to collaborate. He says, Ike, I don't like your code. So Dustin can go into his cell here. You want to go into CMD3? I'm yep. adding oh. a new one. Oh, that's Dustin. Look at It's time to ask you. I'm not pre-baking the turkey. Instead of talking about so markdown. I'm, <laughs> so I was writing code, and Dustin said, hey, let's actually write some real code that people can read here. And Ready? we're evolving this project, and we're collaborating it together. And this is like a game-changing feature um, it, for developing ML models, or prep, or pipelining, or cleaning, or anything you're doing here. This is super fun. It's a super fun way to create solutions and write code. Okay, So that is our first cool thing you can do in Databricks. Was that worth it? 
Are you glad you came? Yay, yay, yay. All right. So now we're going to go to number two. All right. Oh, wait, a question. Yeah. Wait, what's that question? So can you make it dynamic by putting a variable into the markdown? Right. You know, I don't know. Let's find out. You guys <laughs> do the next demo, I'll see if we can. Okay. <laughs> All right, if you can switch over to. Yeah, you want, we're, you're number three. Let's see if it works. Over here. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Can it read JSON? Can markdown read JSON? Like, can you format so, the JSON in the markdown? Yeah, there, uh, there should be something to format code, and I think that'll work fine with JSON, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, to be a, honest, I use the cheat sheets all the time. So I'm pretty yeah. confident I've done that, but I would go to the cheat sheet, see what it's got. Um, yeah, there's some for documenting code, and I think that'll take care of it for you, unless you had a different opinion. No, I think that's right. Okay. Sounds right. Sorry, Mickey. Any other questions on this first bit? All right, let's keep moving then. I'm going to talk about how well, let me clarify first. I love notebooks. They're really great. I'm actually starting to use them quite a bit now, as of recently. But when I'm developing a large project with a team of people, and we want to reuse a lot of functionality and possibly just import it into my little notebook cell and have all kinds of magic that I've written in advance happen behind the scenes and just do a simple statement in my notebook, we start to work on this big Python library that needs to be, you know, versioned in source control separate from my notebooks and needs to be uh, compiled into wheels files and uploaded to the cluster to be usable. You don't need to follow all of that piece, but what I want to tell you is that when you get into that mode, you start to really appreciate your IDE. Some of you may already use Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, as I have on my Mac here, and you may love it, and you may start using the notebooks, and even though your scenario doesn't match my larger project, you still might just go, I want to use Visual Studio Code. I know it. I love it. Why am I in a web interface when I could be in here? Uh, if you want to use command line, you could do that too. I'm not going to demonstrate that um, because this is a little bit better in my opinion. So what I want to show you is just a little bit of the setup. I have, I have a blog article that talks through the whole setup. The documentation is not bad either. I think I probably save you a few steps that they cover. Um, but I want to show you real quick how we set up this Python environment just to make sure uh, especially if you're new to this and you're starting to get going with Python in order to do Spark on Databricks, um, just a couple of little tips when you get started might save you some time later. So I'm going to switch over to my terminal window, make sure that it's visible. Uh oh. It was visible. What happened? It was? Okay. And see if I can continue to zoom in because it looks smaller than I thought it would. All right, I'm just gonna start typing. I hope most of you can see this. Um, so what I'm going to do is use uh, a conda environment. A conda environment, or in Python we have virtual environments, it's a isolated place to build a little programming environment, install all the libraries and dependencies you need, use them for that, whatever set of code you decide to tie back to that virtual environment, and then um, we don't, get stuck using those same versions of those same libraries on the next big project we work on. So the recommended way and the way that I think the documentation plus my articles recommend is to go install Miniconda. I'm not going to cover all those dependencies. You also have to have Java. I'm not going to cover those dependencies. But once you have it set up, we can, um, and you've created the initial environment with just a couple of simple commands, we can activate that environment by using conda activate dbconnect, which is my conda environment name. And if you haven't done live demos in front of people, you'll know your computer does stuff it never does. <laughs> uh, so it's way at the bottom of the screen. I think I can fix this, but this might just get worse. Let's give it a shot. And yet I still will never pre-record the de demos. I don't know why. Okay. So one thing I want you to see, if you can see the screen at all, is it now says this word DB connect to the left in parentheses. That tells me what Conda environment, virtual environment does it the same way. There's two different ways to do this. I'm showing Conda. It tells me what environment I'm in. So now I, I know what I'm working with. 
And then to get Databricks Connect, which is this magic that lets us work from an IDE, but actually run this stuff on a real Spark cluster, our real Databricks cluster, save me from having to install Spark locally on my machine. Uh, it's not too bad on a Mac. It's a little bit tougher on Windows. You all might have no problem with it, but for me, it's a little tougher on Windows <laughs> to get Spark running locally. Um, so I'm able to just go, hey, once I call Spark, once I say, Spark, go do this stuff, go run against my real cluster. It's got like four workers going right now, a whole lot more horsepower than my machine, and I can, I can run real stuff. So before I get there, I have to install. In Python, we use this thing called pip to install pretty much everything. You can also use conda install and a few variations. But uh, you're going to pip install a library called Databricks Connect, and you have to tell it a version that matches your Databricks runtime. A lot of things I'm leaving out that you'll see in the documentation. This one I want to call out for you to help you out. Uh, your Databricks runtime is going to be 5.4, 5.5. You're going to make sure you do this equals equals 5.4 star. Once I do that, I've already installed it, so you don't have to watch it download everything. The next step you'll do after, for you, it'll take a few minutes to download everything. Um, Databricks connect configure. Again, I've pre-populated this, so it'll be pretty quick, but what's happening here is it's saying, hey, you want to run this on a cluster, you better tell me which cluster you want to run on, and you need to give me a token so that I know that you have access to run on this cluster. So I won't go too, de too much detail, I want to actually show it run from the IDE in just a moment here, but the values you'll see in these square brackets are real values that I put in the last time I did this. Uh, consult the documentation to see the nice picture that highlights all the pieces of your web page that has all this information basically baked into the URL for the most part and you just kind of have to piece it together. But once you get it going, you create your token, you'll enter that. This is my cluster ID, this doubt 556. You have about 30 minutes to try and hack me before I destroy all this stuff. <laughs> and uh, you will definitely use 8787 for Azure. But there's a little note for those of you who might do multi-cloud or do AWS that you can actually run this against AWS as well. Now I've just set this all up. I don't run Databricks Connect test because sometimes it fails and that doesn't tell me anything. What I care about is does my code work against the cluster I want it to work against. So coming into Visual Studio Code, the only magic I've done here is, well besides installing the Python extensions and then normal setup the Visual Studio Code for Python, is down here I get to pick my Python version, I click on it, and I pick the correct virtual environment, in this case my Conda environment, DB Connect, click on it. It should tell me, if this wasn't a demo, it would already tell me in the bottom corner that I'm using the correct environment. Let's give it a shot. Let's try running this and see if it's running in the right environment. Well, I can show you the results from earlier to, to demonstrate. So what we're gonna see here, we're gonna have a little bit of a slow moving demo for a moment, and it might fail, which will be a fun experience. But don't worry, I'm going to show you PyCharm as well, and that one's definitely configured correctly because that's what I do every day. Here we go. This is Spark stuff happening. And at some point really soon, I think right there, it shows me a URL that says this is where I'm doing all this work. Click on this to go see like the Spark UI and drill into the details. There's actually, I think, a little, yeah, so I'd have to grab that link. Might as well do it. Uh, it printed my standard out to my console, which is great for this little experiment. I can show you code that was pulled from Azure Data Lake Storage. Databricks is set up to read Azure Data Lake Storage. It's got a schema on top of it. I read it in, and I just printed it to my IDE, just like you'll do every day for your analytics. Um, no, but it's a good example of how we can actually reach out, pull back data, make things happen from the IDE. I did want to show you real quick the UI, since we've talked about Spark. Might as well see what a Spark job UI looks like. All right, so the main thing you'll take away from this is, hey, there's a lot going on. If I haven't seen this before, it's going to take me a moment to figure it all out. But what I want to show you is that once you know where to click, you can click through this job that just ran. It'll show you a little DAG, a little directed acyclic graph. And um, you can keep on going down the details. And somewhere or another, it's going to show me all the details for all the different tasks that ran in parallel to pull back that bit of data and return the top 20 rows, which is what I told it to do. So like magic, I'm working with Spark from my IDE. If you are really wanting to be a true Python developer, then you <laughs> will want to install PyCharm. <laughs> We've been arguing about this for days, so don't worry about it. Don't worry about that. You don't have to go with PyCharm. That's just my preference. <laughs> um, you can do the same kind of thing here. And there's really not much to do besides prove it works. Um, but I can switch over to 
to my uh, same exact code. It's actually the same folder. They're pointing at the same one right now. And I've already configured it to use Databricks, Databricks Connect under my configurations. Somewhere in here, I have told it which interpreter to use. And I run this, and the same kind of thing is going to happen here. I'll see the same kind of results, see the same kind of link. I'll click on it, show you the same thing. We can skip that part. I think you got it. Um, yeah, and so I love working with the IDE, especially when we're getting these bigger projects where we're building this whole framework that we're going to leverage from all kinds of notebooks. Hope that's helpful to see it's possible. A little bit of the configuration. Yeah, what questions? Uh, that's what you this, is, this is specific to Databricks, what I'm showing you right now. Does the IDE work with Jupyter? Like, can I run Jupyter Notebooks locally from my IDE? Yeah, can we touch uh, the transfer Jupyter From local? I would, so, so Databricks Connect is a client library, so I would think so. Mm -hmm. right? You should be able to. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I was like, uh, maybe, but I've never done it. So <laughs> you, can, you can use it from all sorts of things because it's a client library locally. It's really just Python's doing it. I can go to the Python REPL, start typing Spark stuff. And as long as I'm in the right environment that I've done this configuration, it'll hit that cluster I told it to. But again, if you really like Jupyter, Databricks has its own implementation of Jupyter inside it. Right. Yeah. And if the cluster is not running, like, I know Power BI automatically skips up if the cluster is not running, but in this case, it has to be running, right? Yeah. So no, for no, the DB, it'll spin it up. With Databricks Connect, it'll tell you, oh, cluster's starting up, and you'll just sit there and watch yeah. your screen for about five minutes longer. Uh, and then it should, should run in everything normally. So we do that a lot. We run our first, I didn't really show this part, but we have unit tests that are actually using Spark directly because that's the, by far the easiest way to like actually test it in a, in a good way. We run this thing and it goes, oh, cluster's not up. We're going to run for five minutes. You're like, oh, man, I already got my cup of coffee. I forgot <laughs> to start the cluster first. So yeah, it'll do that for you, which is great. Makes you way less worried about the cluster auto-terminating and saving us money overnight and all that kind of thing. All right, we need to move on. Yep. OK. Yep. Well, I am streaming. next talking about streaming, <laughs> so we'll see how fast this goes. Um, what I'm going to do here, you don't really need to worry about what's happening behind the curtain, but I'm going to kick off this job that reads a line from a file and writes to event hubs. So I think I'll save the pitch on why you should care about streaming. Maybe we'll yeah. come back to that at the end. Um, but event hubs is a streaming platform that will ingest a whole bunch of data from a producer, and then the consumer that wants to use that data will go to event hub and get it. Um, in a streaming fashion. And so it's kind of the middle layer to let us do pub sub, produce, consume. Uh, it's very similar to Kafka. And what I want to show you that I think is really cool is well, I'm going to use the Kafka APIs from Spark to interact with event hubs. The reason I'm so excited we can use the Kafka APIs is that I've already written Spark code that hits Kafka like many, many times. And so I could go, oh yeah, I know how to do this. This is easy. All I have to do is learn a couple of configuration changes. Boom, we're doing streaming from Azure Databricks with code that is very familiar to the Spark community. And let's hope our cluster has not slowed down on me. So let me kick off my streaming consumer, make sure this stuff's running, and uh, we can talk about the code just briefly. So here I'm in my own notebook. I'm getting my secret, not from plain text, because you shouldn't do that. But I have, uh, I have included right above it not the best format. I should have used Markdown for this. Uh, I've concluded an example of what this connection string that we're going to pass in to this next bit as the password, what this actually looks like. So when you're trying to find that in the Azure uh, Event Hub screen, you, you kind of know what we're working with here. I build up this really interesting SA EH SASL string that once you know it, it's easy. But the first time, you just got to get this Kafka shaded correct, all this fun stuff. And now I build up a config. Uh, it's, this is pretty much what I would expect to do for event hubs. If you do security differently, you might switch it up. And then the rest of this, uh, we haven't talked a lot about Spark code, but this looks almost the same as batch Spark code, except I'm using read stream instead of read. A few different configurations. I'm definitely using Kafka, which isn't really, um, well, you can do that with batch too, actually. But I'm using Kafka as the, as the source. I kick this guy off, and we can see this thing's running by the squiggly green line and the um, moving blue bars down here. The other thing I want to show then is that I can read that stream with, uh, I can read, yeah, I can not read from Kafka, but I'm going to read stream on a Delta file. So I'm going to read an actual file in my data lake or a folder of files in my data lake and display that for us on the screen here. And 
right about here in line, line four, where I don't have any code, is where you would take the uh, JSON, or in this case, it's just a string of data, unpack it into like an actual columns, you know, da data frame. I'm not doing that. I'm just printing out a string of CSV. And there we go. We're using Event Hubs with the Kafka API from Spark, getting all the benefits of Event Hubs, all the benefits of running across a clustered machine. And we can do streaming. We don't need to tell everyone that it's got to be batch. We can do streaming now. Uh, once we get to monitoring, it gets a little trickier, but we can write the code pretty darn easy and reuse a whole lot of our Spark code to do it. How many of you have application developers at your company that love to use messaging between applications? How many of you are interested in that data? So that was very little um, code and configuration to start pulling data off of those streams and ingesting it. And it could be any kind of data, IoT data. It could be data um, from a log file that's getting published or web activity or clickstream or something like that. All sorts of data could be there that would be interesting that you'd want to store for later anal analysis or that you might want to immediately react to, right? So that's why that's cool. And uh, how quick and easy that was to just start using the stream, super quick. And I can take a question while you switch, I, uh, switch Simon over and yep. make sure you're ready to go. Uh, well, let's take like one question, then we can talk some more afterwards. Um, uh, right here uh, to the left had the hand yeah, up. So, uh, So I set up the. So I don't have Kafka running, so there's no Zookeeper, which is kind of cool. Um, I'm using Event Hubs as pretending like Event Hubs is Kafka. Kafka. There's this thing called Event Hubs for Kafka. So I set up the Event Hubs namespace. I set up a specific Event Hub, copied the connection string from the properties, and then configured it all to use the Kafka API. Oh, okay. Yeah. And there is some check. There, I'm, I think I'm using a file for checkpointing. I am doing some amount of checkpointing, and then it's just kind of taking care of the rest. But the cool part right. of that, by the way, is that um, you can use the Kafka API because we're data engineers, but the application developers don't have to do that, and we can still see the same messages, which is cool. OK, so unless this is going to be four cool things you can do with Databricks, yeah, we I need know, to hurry we gotta up. Yeah, we got to go, we got to go. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we want to use Databricks, right? We want to use a notebook. But we need to integrate it into the big wider ecosystem of everything we're doing. Uh, so I use Data Factory. That's my orchestration tool. That's my thing that's saying run this, then run the next thing, then run the next thing. It's giving me that workflow. So there are a few things you can do with a notebook to make it accessible to that stuff. So this is called a widget. A little bit of code, DB utils. So word of warning, if you see something called DB utils, that's a Databricks utility. That means it's Databricks specific. So if you're using like generic vanilla Spark, it won't have those things in there. So DB utils dot widgets dot text, that's saying, at the top, add in this parameter. So if I just quickly do that again, it's going to remove that. It's going to drop that widget from there. So to create that, weirdly inside my text, I define the things at the start of my thing. It's, it takes a while to get your mind around it. So I created this object. It's a new parameter I'm expecting. The parameter object is called file name. So my widget is called file name. I'm defaulting a value to product. And I'm saying, you know, I'll give that a label of input parameter, make it nice to use. OK, straightforward. I can add up, chain up a load of parameters, expose them. I can do straight text, drop down, multi-select. There's a few different options. If I want to use it, dbutils.widgets.get. Super easy. So I need to say file name. That's the name of the object. So I'm creating a variable. I can call this whatever I want. Equals dbutils.widgets.get. And that will be populated with the current value of that parameter. So each time I run this notebook, if I'm passing in a parameter at the top, then this value will change. So if I just populate that, create that variable, simply just associating those two. And if I say, show me what file name is, that's currently product. So now I've got somewhere where I can put something into my notebook, and then all the way through my code, I can be using that. And having done a quick check, doesn't look like you can inject a variable into Markdown, which is annoying, but still. OK, then on the flip side, I've got this, dbutils.notebook.exit. That allows me to take a string, and whatever called my notebook gets that as its output parameter. So this is kind of the inverse. This is passing parameters back into the thing that called it. So in this case, I'm using a bit of JSON. I'm building up a JSON message. And if I just run that, you can see what's going to be passed out. And that's pretty cool. So there we go. That's what's going to be passed out to my parent. But the main thing is, how do we use that? How do we actually hook that into Data Factory? So I've got Data Factory sitting here. I can just call a notebook. So I've got my Databricks activity. So when I'm sitting here, I can see various different activities in there. I can call a notebook, I can call a jar file, which is a compiled Scala script. I can call a, a bit of Python lying around in blob storage. In this case, I'm sticking with a notebook, and I'm saying, you know what? 
run it on a particular link service. So in Data Factory, you need to know that the link service you're using is pointing at a specific cluster. So I need to say this is running on my big cluster, my small cluster, on a different cluster. And inside that, in my settings, I can choose my notebook. So I can say browse. And it gives me that nice browser of what's actually deployed to my Databricks workspace. I can pick the um, notebook I'm trying to run. And then underneath that, I've got that base parameters. So I can tell it, you know what? There's a widget called file name. I want you to pass this in there. So this is my method of just passing things in. But then it gets really cool when you actually start using more data factory things. The quick example I've got, so this is calling a different notebook of mine. And that notebook just uses a straight data frame that splits a data set. So it says, for this particular data set, try and apply this structure. If any rows don't fit that structure, put them in a rejected row. And that's not too big a script. So I've got that. It's calling a notebook, it's passing parameters down. I've got a parent data factory, and that's saying, look up a whole list of stuff. Get all of the different tables I'm trying to work with. Do a for each loop, and then for each of those activities, call that child pipeline. So I'm just going to span out and just call 10 different data factory pipelines, passing a different parameter into each one. And that's going to run that notebook 10 times with different variables. I've just suddenly automated my life, and life is happy again. I'm just going to trigger that. That'll kick off. And if we go over to monitor in data factory, we should suddenly see. So I've got my parent ones running. That'll go off and talk. Suddenly, I've now got a load of child pipelines all running. And inside, I can see. So that was passing in sales order header. It's passing in sales order detail. So I'm just running this for each of my, my favorite adventure works tables, right? And then that's actually going off talking to the cluster. If I drill down, so I've got that little pipeline button, I can see what's actually happening on that particular run. I can get a little link that's going to point me to that specific execution for that notebook. Click it, opens up my notebook, and I can see actually what's happening. So this one had that parameter passed in, and I can get the results. So suddenly, the notebook's no longer just this one isolated bit of script. It's now a reusable component I can just be spinning over and using as a flexible part of my whole ETL process. Pretty cool? Yeah. Pretty cool. <laughs> so. I told, he showed me this last night, and I said, we need to rename this fucking session. It's one cool thing. You're going to show that, <laughs> and that's all they need to see, because that was amazing, Simon. I was impressed last night, and, and it ran. it's there amazing. Yeah. And the one last thing I wanted to show is that output. Mm -hmm. So for that particular run, I can see in Data Factory, I've got my output as part of that activity. So if I've got like, the next steps in Data Factory, it can be saying, if rejected rows is more than zero, send an email, send an alert, do something else. Make sure I need to go and find out why those rows didn't matter. So that first step, data validation, is easy. Love it. Love it. All right. That's amazing. OK, I'll be my own DJ and go back to me. I'm next, right? Secrets? Yeah, secrets. OK, cool. So I know this, is my, this part of my demo is a little bit boring, but here's what I want you to get out of it. You can store your secrets like usernames and passwords and keys and anything that's special about the configuration of your application that you might want to keep away from your code. You can store that in something called Azure Key Vault, and you should be doing that. Now, I don't want to be your mom, but um, I don't want to remind you to clean your room or store your secrets away from your code. But obviously, if the code gets compromised in development, you wouldn't want production passwords in the code that would then widen what, what is now compromised into production, right? Did you hear the keynote today? Did, did, were you as ashamed of yourself as I was? <laughs> All right. So configure Azure Key Vault. Azure Key Vault's really easy, by the way. You could just like, hey, I've got a secret here. I don't want to give away all my secrets right here. This is actually some of Dustin's secrets. But just to kind of show you what a secret looks like, is I can say the name of the secret, I don't know if you can read that, is test pass demo Ike right there. Do you see that? And for the value, I can type in a value, I love Dustin. OK? And Aww. Simon, and Simon. Ah. All, right. <laughs> All right. And then if I click create, that value of test pass demo Ike now <coughs> equals whatever I just typed in. That now equals that. Now, you just saw Simon do something pretty cool um, where he said, if you see DB utils, what do you think? Databricks, right? So what I say is, hey, I've got a scope name called Pass Demo and a key name called Test Pass Demo Ike, and I want you to go. This is all built into Azure Databricks. I want you in one line of code, line four, go to Azure Key Vault, 
go get that key name and tell me what the value is. And then in this little quick code, we're just <coughs> going to test to make sure that it's password, just like she told us to do in the keynote, right? And what, what the cluster is going to return, and what's the cluster going to say? Fail, because I actually did type by Lev, Dustin, and Simon. So if I come back here and do a new version and type password, and then I create that, and I come back to Key Vault, uh, excuse me, to Databricks, and I go get it. Oh, now it matches, right? So you can see how now I can change passwords away from the code. And what that allows us to do is have a different set of passwords for development data. And then when we move the same code to production, have a different set of values in production and not have to alter the code when we switch from development to production. And it's really that simple. And it's baked into the product. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not now putting secrets, because the secret is now the, the key, the secret key inside your session. Or am I missing? Well, no, no, no. So the, key, the if you try to log into Databricks using test pass demo Ike, it will fail. Right? What it needs is the value that was stored in here, right? Whatever that value is, right? So you're dis, you're decoupling what the code looks like from what the actual value is, so much so that the developer might never know what the actual value is. So you, the developer can write code like this and not be able to directly log into Databricks or any, or let's say it's Azure Blob Storage. Like for instance, in this example right here, this is Azure Blob Storage. This is using secrets to say, you know with Azure Blob Storage, you've got a URL and you've got a key. This is keeping the key separate so that we just do a little bit of string concatenation. We do DB utils to bring it back and a little bit of string concatenation to say put that key at the end of it and then go get some data and show me that data, right? And Does that try, make sense? If you try and log it, uh, at least from this environment, it'll say redacted, it's not gonna print it out for you. So obviously he was able to guess it, yeah. something to look at, but it's not gonna just print it out for you as soon as you right. try. So, so. It, is, it is secure and by the way, software developers are already doing this to the nth degree and it's really important that as data engineers and data professionals, we follow suit and do the same best practices. Yeah, and then we gotta go, because he, Absolutely. Yeah. Yep, absolutely you can do that. Yep, absolutely. for sure. Yeah, widget. I like it. I like this guy. All right. Yeah, he was my favorite before. He's my favorite now. Okay, so MLflow okay. is a fancy Databricks thing. Uh, it's all to do with data science. So if you're developing a data science model, it's an iterative process. So you don't guess it right first time. You try it with different mixes of parameters. You try it with different data sets. Even when you've got your perfect model and it's in production, then Actually, the data's gonna change over time. You're gonna have to retrain it, you need to refresh it. Um, and it's hard to keep track of that stuff. How do you know, even more and more, people are starting to track bias. You're starting to say, well, why did your machine learning model make that decision? You know, if you said yes or no, you're approved for credit, you need to prove that you've actually got a, a real reason for having made that decision. MLflow's trying to solve that problem. So I've got this thing called an MLflow experiment. And every time I retrain my model, I can track the results. So I've got a load of different trains running here. I've got a particular experiment. So I write that up, I've got that experiment ID. That is the unique ID for this particular experiment. And I can be running lots of different models. I could try it with different algorithms, different attempts, track my results against here, so I can then compare and contrast what was the better one. So I'm using that experiment. And then in here I've got, <laughs> uh, I've got various different results going back. So I'm passing in some parameters and keeping track of various different results that came up. And I'm passing some metrics so I can track accuracy, can track latency. Uh, I can drill down on it. I can say, actually, for this one, what was the particular version of code? So all notebooks have got this thing at the side. You've got this revision history. So actually, even if someone's come in and changed my code and it's advanced so many times away, I've logged my model against a particular version of that code. So I can go back and say exactly what was the script that generated this model. So there's a load of stuff in here to do that. I'm not going to step through this because this is a giant data science notebook of doom. But the main <laughs> thing that you need to see, right down at the bottom, once we create our model, there's a few things we can do. So you've got this import ML flow. So it's a separate library. I have to bring that library into context. I'm bringing my model into context, and I've got this with MLflow start experiment, and I'm giving it that run ID. So that's what I'm actually saying. The next bit of code, for the, have the next bit of context, this is the experiment I want you to track against. I can then do my training of my model, 
I'm using log parameter. I'm saying, actually, this is something I want you to record against my experiment. This is a useful value. Keep, remember this. Then, down at the bottom, I've got my log my metrics. So I can use my evaluator. I can put out what was the accuracy of it. I can track these really important metrics about our model. And then even better, I can log an artifact. I can log the CSV of data that I used to train it. And that takes that data set, saves it into the Databricks file system, and it retains it there. So if I go into that experiment, I can drill down and find the actual data set that generated that model. So I've now got full auditability and lineage of where my models are coming from, which is pretty cool. Very cool. Very cool. Yes. Hi. <laughs> So there is, there is a, a fancier version of MLflow coming, and that'll even have things like a full model repository. So you can actually go and set, it'll just use that to control what's the current production version of that model, and then just replace it without then having to change all your code. So there's loads more stuff coming in there, and if you're working in data science, definitely take a look at that stuff. Yeah. One more question. Oh, that is a dangerous question. <laughs> uh, the one thing to be aware of is this is good for large-scale distributed machine learning, and that's not appropriate for every use case. So if you're doing something that has a whole lot of data, you're trying to train it off a data set that's big enough to bother distributing it in memory across a big Spark cluster, then you'd use this. But machine learning services has some similar things. They are kind of competing products for the model registry stuff, and it kind of like depends where your main environment is. All right. Is it my turn? Uh, hyperscale. OK. So we're switching topics. Thank you, by the way, Simon. That was awesome. Um, so we did a project recently where we were ingesting a whole lot of data into Azure SQL Database. And we were really upset because the whole purpose of Databricks is that the scale is separate from the code. So what we wanted to do is take a whole bunch of data, and we wanted to prove that if we had four nodes, we went twice as fast as two nodes, right? And if we had eight nodes, not twice. I mean, we didn't think twice, right? But we wanted to see that, hey, if we increased our money, do we increase our performance? Wouldn't that be great, right? And what the, here's the problem. There's no product members for Azure SQL DB in here either. So Azure SQL DB had a lot of log contention. And so we weren't able to make it even closely do what we thought it should do in performance. And we were really, really disappointed because we looked, it looked like we needed that feature. And so I went, to the, um, I went to Simon, actually, and I went to the product team, and I went to other people, and they said, well, you're having log contention, and you should get, go use hyperscale. And so what we did was we switched. We actually did get good performance in managed instance business critical also. So we got good performance with that, pretty good performance, but we also got good performance with Hyperscale. Um, and they released a library. And so this demo is actually showing you two different things. The first thing is, for those of you who know, what language <coughs> does this look like? What language is that? Right. Yeah, PySpark, right. What language is this down here? What does that look like? Right, and it's in the same notebook. And so the reason why we switched to Scala is because the library that Microsoft released for us to do this work, they released with the documentation in Scala. And we weren't good enough to figure out what it did in Python in a timely manner because it kept failing on us for like a week. So we're just like, we'll just do it in Scala then. That's fine. But the cool thing is that we mixed Python and Scala code in one notebook where we're going and retrieving a bunch of data and populating a temporary view with that data, but the data is staying in place. And then we're taking that data. And what we're doing here is we're using the bulk loader um, to go and feed that data into hyperscale. And the magic here is line 26. So the point is, it's going to go grab a whole bunch of data, and it's going to load it super fast. And we did see with hyperscale that four cores uh, were significantly faster than two, and eight were significantly faster than four. And it proved out our use case, which is we needed the ability to complete in a timely manner, no matter how much data we're using. And we want the data to end relational in SQL Server. Now, that would be a really boring demo to watch you guys uh, have me watch you. You know, you want to watch me ingest a few gigs over five minutes? No? OK. But the code, do you agree the code looks simple? Just use the bulk loader, right? 
Okay, and use hyperscale or use managed instance business critical? Well, then these were the numbers that we found. One gig in about 48 seconds, 3.4 gigs in 1.6 minutes um, with hyperscale, and then a little bit slower on the business critical. But um, what we really liked about hyperscale is we were able to move the solution over to it, and it really wasn't as expensive as we thought it would be. Um, the bill for one time in our life, a cloud bill came in cheaper than we thought it would be come in. So, um, so we were grateful for that. So I know that's not a glamorous demo, but for those of you who might be facing similar problems, we thought you would appreciate that learning because uh, it, it really was astounding to us. Thanks. If you end up trying to use the JDBC reader writer, not this SQL DB one, pause for a moment. You'll have time because it'll be taking a long time to do what you're trying to do. Pause and be like, hey, I talked about this one time and go searching for it for Azure in, in particular. It's going to help you out a lot. And we'll have our video available to you, so you can, the video will go into more depth, yep. Is that at all available on your just using the bulk loader now that ADR is available across the Azure uh, SQL DB surface area? They um, haven't implemented that into the JDBC driver yet. So yeah, someone can now go and release an updated version of that JDBC driver and then it should work. But currently, the driver that's baked into Databricks won't take advantage of those bulk loaders. Okay, what's next? If you find better ways, tweet me, because yeah, I need to know as much as I can about how to do this. <laughs> yeah, all right. anybody have better ideas, <laughs> we, we're, we're all ears. Yep. Okay, so here we go. We're going to go to Dustin, and we're going to talk about Delta Lake. Yes, this is going to be the two-minute intro to Delta Lake and a couple of cool tricks that it allows us to do. So this slide here is probably not the best place to start, but for the two minutes, this is where I'm starting. We've got a diagram that is uh, one you'll see a lot from Databricks right now, and we're basically showing here's our pipelines, for doing data lakes. We're going to be doing streaming and batch data into our data lakes. We're going to have different levels of tables, meaning different uh, amounts of processing and refinement we do. That's what gold, uh, gold, silver, bronze means, which you don't actually have to call anything that to use Delta Lake. But the really important piece is that bottom piece, which says your existing data lake. Delta Lake is taking the parquet format that we use a lot in big data. It's, there's tons of information on it if you're not familiar. It's what we use in big data most of the time. It's taking that, adding some metadata and some transaction logs to it to allow us to do things that we can't do with plain old parquet and we've been working around for years. So just the brief view, Simon, Simon's probably going to show us a little bit more of this too, is um, if the my table at the top is your table directory, you're going to have a whole bunch of files in there. That's how we organize it in data lakes. Um, you're going to have an underscore delta log, and that's where all this metadata and transaction logs are going to be. That's where all the magic's happening. Don't mess with it. You can look, you can look at it if you want, but don't like, mess around in there, or you're going to hose yourself. So let's see a couple of cool tricks, huh? The first thing I'm going to show you is time travel. Is that not the coolest name for a feature? What time travel means is data versioning. Uh, and typically, with your kind of default table setup, you're going to be able to go back seven to 30 days. It's not going to be all the way back in time. I think Simon might know some tricks to pull that off. But um, let's just assume it's going to be seven to 30 days of history so that when we're making updates, when we're deleting stuff, I actually used to, in BigQuery, my nightly ETL would go and check for all changes, all new records that weren't there yesterday just by using this type of feature. Uh, it's comparable to temporal tables in SQL. So hopefully that helps a lot of people get the context. Um, Comparable, not identical, just to be clear. Um, but basically, the way we're going to use this is uh, a couple of tricks. We'll upload these. You can go, go play with the code yourself. And um, we're going to import this delta table section. And once we've set up our table by pointing to a path that has delta files, I secretly was doing this earlier when I was streaming data out. I can view the history, and I can see some different versions and timestamps. Since, since I was doing streaming, I have a whole bunch of versions. You don't exactly want a whole bunch of versions, but that's what we've got. Um, to get a simple count, did I save the results? Oh, I lost all the results, so we may skip forward. But to get a simple count here on the current version, we're going to see I had like 3,400. If I go way back to version 4 by doing this clever command on line 6, version as of, and I put a number that I've seen in that history, I go all the way back to when I used to have 25 records. And I can do the same thing with the timestamp. I have this timestamp format that I actually just grabbed out of the log right before this demo. And I can do timestamp as of, run that guy, we'll get the same number, we'll get 25. You can do all this in Spark SQL if you want. And that's time travel, which I think is pretty neat. Uh, probably a whole lot of use cases you can come up with for it that are better than what I just showed. Um, 
A uh, couple, couple things I'll just call out are there. You can find, find this online on our, uh, once we tweet this out, is you can do a merge now. You can do an upsert in a data lake, uh, which is something I wanted to do for, for years. So this is a pretty exciting feature to save us a lot of coding and a lot of headache. Um, there is the basic syntax that you would use. And then we can delete. We can delete records from our data lake tables. And with just a little bit of optimization type stuff, we're actually not in bad shape for doing it. And All these SQL amazing. professionals are like, you can delete. Everyone's like, of <laughs> course you can delete. Yeah. But oh, man, this is exciting. <laughs> yeah. With you have that, to have felt the pain to know how cool that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With that, I'll let Simon tell us a little bit more related to Delphi. All right. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Dustin. That was great. Cool. So, so I firstly, a little bit of a crash course in Parquet in 30 seconds. <laughs> Parquet is good because it's column store, right? So if you're using SQL Server, if you use a column store index, you're like, yeah, compression's amazing. It does things really well. Parquet is the same thing, but as a flat file. And one of the reasons why we get such good compression in Parquet is a thing called run length encoding. And that's if I've just got loads and loads of data, because I'm compressing each column, not rows, I can look at uh, values, like so, you know, values that follow each other for a certain column. So if I've got a particular column, and I go, this is value A, and the next 1,000 rows have got the same value, rather than storing that value a 1,000 times, I just go, OK, A, a for the next 1,000. What's the next value? And you get massive compression ratios because of this thing called run length encoding. Awesome. For, for you SQL professionals, what does that look like? Right, yeah, you guys see this. <laughs> so, oh, one of the things. Store. Oh, but did you also know, well, real, real quick, sorry, I, did, I wasn't listening, maybe I'm the one that's not paying attention. <laughs> so, real quick, like Column Store, guess what Radius Cache does? Guess what Snowflake does? Guess what Aurora DB does? Guess what just about any big data solution for the last yeah. you know, six years that have gotten amazing performance out of traversing large, large data structures do? This thing that we're doing with Parquet, you know, and then every vendor will tell you, this is black magic, only we do it. It's not true. They're all doing just about the mm -hmm. exact same thing, and it's this, right? However, with great power comes great responsibility, because this means it's really easy to get it wrong. This means if you've got small files, it's not going to compress at all. If I'm like, doing in each individual row is an insert statement, Parquet files, because it's compressed, they're immutable. I can't go and edit what's inside there. So if I'm inserting lots of rows, I'm creating lots of small, tiny, individual Parquet files. And because they don't have a lot of row data in it, they're not going to compress that well. So that is a bit of a danger. So over here, I'm going to play around. Now, one thing to notice, everything that we've done so far, we've been using Python. This is a SQL notebook. So this is now just assuming everything I'm doing is SQL. So I can just register some tables that are in here. I've got a little tab over here, which is data. And that's actually going to tell me what tables I currently got associated with my data cluster. So you don't have to be going off and writing data frames and writing code every time. You can actually register a load of tables, still as Parquet in a lake, but get your data analyst to then go, OK, select star from taxis, and that'll just work. So Hive is pretty cool. But the main thing is, in the rest of here, I've got that table registered. I'm just going to refresh it. I'm just going to drop that table from that Hive store. And I'm going to recreate that table so it goes over brings that in, and just registers it. So I'm not making a new copy of the data. I'm just registering that table with Hive. Now, I've got Storage Explorer up. So over actually inside my lake, if I look inside that addresses table, you can see what we're going to see. So we've got two bits. We've got a Parquet file, and it's horribly named, but no one cares. So that's our existing data. And I've got this log. And this is kind of that building up list of JSON files. So every time I'm doing something to that delta table, it's creating a new JSON file that says, I've just added this Parquet data. I've added these files. I've removed these ones. If I delete, it's not actually deleting rows. It's marking those files as logically deleted in my transaction log. Because that's how delta's working. It's by this transaction log behind the scenes. So let's just try and play around a little bit. I'm just going to insert some dummy data into that table. So I'm going to run there. Just running an insert. Again, standard SQL stuff. It's updating that. There we go. Let's run it again. Just want to create some dummy stuff, push the data into it. It's going through. Let's do it one more time. And then over in our Storage Explorer, we hit refresh. See, each one of those inserts is creating an individual Parquet file. So there is like zero repeated rows because it's just one line going in at a time. And that's, that's no good. So I can have a look, make sure I've got some data. Again, just play around, write SQL code. Happy, happy days. And you can see it's not always immediate response, because it's still going to the lake. It's still reading the Parquet files out. It's still, there is an overhead of parallelism. 
I've got some things I can say describe it. What does that data look like? Tell me the metadata. I can go and say, well, actually, where does that live in the lake? How many files does it belong to? And actually can say, ah, oh, there's a load of, there's four files under there. Okay. So how do we fix that? How do you make that better? And this is the answer. Optimize. Now, be a little bit careful because there's two versions of Delta. So Databricks, they open sourced this thing called Delta Lake. So Delta Lake is an open source solution. If you're using vanilla Spark, you can install the Delta Lake libraries and get a load of that transaction log functionality. Optimize is the premium fancy Delta. So if you're using Databricks Delta, that's the implementation of Delta inside Databricks, then you've got this optimized function. And what it's gonna do, it's gonna read through the rows and goes, oh, you know what, you've got some inefficient parquet there. Let me just take all of those, logically delete them, and create a new parquet file that sucked all that data together. So we're gonna run the optimize command. Gonna go through, and it should tell me that it's gonna add some rows and remove some rows. But weirdly, what we'll actually see is not that it's taking anything away. We'll see a new parquet file got added. So actually, I've just increased the number of files that I've got. So we have a look at what was actually happening in there. We can get the latest transaction. It's gonna download that JSON file. And we can have a look at what it thinks it was doing. Because the main thing is, again, it's not gonna delete those files, it's gonna logically delete them. So in my trans log, it's gonna tell me, you know what, next time I query that delta table, remember to ignore that particular file. So what have I got? I've got a load of things saying, okay, I've removed these, don't worry about those parquet files, ignore them next time I try, try and query that table, and I've added a new one that is actually the replacement. And that's how time travel works. Because when I say time travel, it goes, okay, ignore all the changes I made after that, which means it doesn't see the new files, it just looks at the old ones. So that's pretty cool, that's good. However, we can make it better. So if I want to tidy that up, if I wanted to actually say, you know what, get rid of those, get rid of those files I don't care about anymore, I've got this one, I've got the vacuum function. And vacuum is saying, anything that's actually now old, just get rid of. Anything that's timed down. Now, I've told it, retain zero hours. And it goes, uh, are you really sure you wanna do that? It's kind of babysitting me a little bit. It's saying, I'm not gonna let you do that. You need to have at least seven days worth of history, right? Don't be a madman. Um, I'm just gonna tell it, actually, no. You're not the boss of me. I'll do what I want. <laughs> Changing a little config over. And again, percentage Python. I'm doing this bit as Python, so don't treat this as SQL. Let's undone that change, remove that restraint. I'm gonna say, do a dry run. Tell me what you're gonna do before you do it. So it's gonna look at there, it's gonna look at the transaction log and say, okay, anything that's logically deleted, anything that's not current state, I can get rid of. And it's gonna tell me what it's gonna plan to do based on that. So it's having a think, reading through it all. And there you go, so it's actually saying, I'm gonna delete all of these files. These are now obsolete files because I've done my optimize, I've got my new fancy one with better compression, get rid of all those singleton inserts. So let's have a go, I'm gonna run my vacuum. It's gonna go away, think about what it's doing. And then when this is run, we should be able to go and have a look at our table again. So what's going on in here? And I've got one parquet file again. So those two things, optimize and vacuum, special functionality just for Databricks Delta, but then managing that stuff, meaning you can do merges, you can do singleton inserts, you can stream into here and actually it'll tidy itself up. So it's kind of like a garbage collector, it's making it efficient. It's kind of like defragmenting an index, a little bit. Yeah? Can you lose the time travel? Yes, so because I've deleted those files, I can no longer time travel, which is why it was having that little warning going, are you sure you want to delete that? So by default, it's seven days, you can make it up to 30 days, so you can kind of play around with those functionality, and that's kind of how much do you want to have that fallback of being able to time travel. And just so everyone, that's with the vacuum, not necessarily the optimize, right? Yeah, yeah. so optimize will do it regardless over your table. And optimize can get really slow, because if you've got like, a ton of stuff in there, then, and you optimize everything, that's gonna try and optimize mm -hmm. your whole thing. But you can optimize on a partition. So you can just say, just do that bit. Do my most recent month, and so it's not gonna grow and be crazy. Cool, 10 minutes left, two more demos, we can do this. We, 10 <laughs> minutes, is that it? Is that all we have, 2.45? Oh, that's so sad, I've been, I really was getting <laughs> to know you guys, I started to, uh, Think about you for Christmas. <laughs> okay, so this is gonna be a kind of, look, I'm gonna show you, if I wanna connect to Databricks or Spark, you just click Get Data here in um, Power BI. Who here uses Power BI? Hey, oh, my people are here, all right. So, and if I wanna use uh, Databricks, it's actually the Spark connector that you use. But what I wanted to point out is, 
you know, he just, uh, Simon just showed that you could get data into Parquet files, right? But if I type in Parquet, there's nothing, no. So isn't that so sad? That's so sad, right? But if I type in Spark, I have Spark here. And if I click on Spark and I connect, it just asks for a URL, right? Here's fill in some information. What's the username and password and the URL? And then here's what happens. I already did that so that you don't have to watch me do that. <coughs> so this is um, a Spark cluster that we have already up and running. And a uh, workspace, pardon me. And what it does is it basically says, these tables are available for you to report on. Now that's the end of my demo. It connected to Spark and it showed you tables. But I... <laughs> that's so nice, TJ. All right, so here's what I want to tell you about why this is cool. What you may have noticed if you're new to big data or you're new to Azure big data is that when Dustin and Simon were giving you their demos, they were showing you that the schema is disconnected from the data. So they were saying the data here is in Parquet, but the schema definition is in a Hive Metastore, right? And when you saw my demo, you saw me interacting with a SQL database in a similar fashion. There's data in there that we then want to persist in our little metadata repository. That, pro that thought process, that design notion, is called data virtualization. And what that means is that inside a metadata layer, we can define a group of tables that are logically together, even if the data is very far apart. So that could be Parquet data, it could be CSV data, it could be SQL data or Oracle data or somewhere in, you know, I don't even know. Do I know that in Power BI? But for all you people that raise your hands, you know what I can do now, don't you? I can ingest that data in an import and in a data model, I can build relationships, I can say slice and dice and build my little star schema and do everything that you love about Power Query and data organization and Power BI and immediately begin reporting off of it. Um, and I don't need to show you that because there's been like every session, there's like time slot three different Power BI sessions that'll show you that, right? But that is the power of using Power BI and Spark, and then all the data sprawl underneath it is the consolidation, organization, and virtualization makes a very pleasant user experience where they can see the data that they're looking for without really even being hyper-concerned where that data might actually be, right? Do you have any set of best practices in terms of security? Yeah, so that security is a big, big question, and we can talk about that maybe in a different session, but I will say, that uh, we do have some best practices wrapped around this. Um, and if you're interested in more about data virtualization, tomorrow I'm giving two different talks on data modeling. One for data modeling for, uh, excuse me, the first session is data modeling for analytics. That's the data modeling trends for 2019 and beyond. That's tomorrow morning. And then tomorrow afternoon, right before you guys catch your flight, I'll do the same thing for transactional applications where you'll start to see some of this new notion about how we organize data um, today. Okay, final demo, we made it, this is good. So I'm gonna tell you how to throw off the shackles of those people preaching about Power BI. <laughs> I think they're the first people to invent data visualization. So I've got a notebook here. Again, I'm using a SQL notebook and it's going against a load of tables I already registered. So these are things I've saved actually into Databricks. I'm just gonna run everything in here. So let's just go run all. The first thing is just a quick describe. So I showed you the describe detail in the last one, which is like the metadata, where's the path, where does it live? Describe itself will just tell me what's actually in that particular table. And hopefully the execution context <laughs> works. We will see, does it go horribly wrong if the execution context doesn't come back? Hmm, interesting. Uh, no, so if you do one all, it'll just sequentially, it'll step down all the cells. See, are you actually doing anything? Well, that's not good. Let's try that again. This doesn't happen in Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Come hang out with me someday, you'll see it happen. There we go, okay, woke up. Okay, so this is just doing a quick bit of metadata scan, show me what's going on. Try again, run everything, I don't wanna have to step through it manually. Okay, so that's going through, running those commands, and just bringing the data back. So I've got this little button down here which means I can choose how I want to display that particular data. So I can have a play around, I can just choose what I want my data to look like. And I've got a few different examples going through. So I've got an area chart, I've got a pie chart, all that kind of stuff. 
Yeah, I know, I put it in mainly because I knew someone had shout at me. <laughs> but then the cool thing I've got right over here, hidden this like super secret little button, is just, you know what? I want you to add you to a dashboard. I want you to make a new dashboard and pin that visual into it. So I can keep going back, so I'm gonna call this, what, mine? Shuby, I can say shiny, but still. Okay, and then if I go back into my code, I can just step through and say, well actually, I want you to add this one to it. Make that as part of it. I can just build up the result sets. So I can just send the, the straight data over if I wanted to. I can send a little map over. And then if I go over to my dashboard, I've got my different dashboards in here. So I can play around with it, I can resize things. It's got some basic functionality. I'm not saying it's an amazing Viz tool. It's really not. But I use this for like ETL stats. If I'm doing all my data processing in this, I can just embed a few charts and graphs and things. So when my support guys are going to look into it, they've got lots of lovely code in their markdown so they understand what's going on. And they've got a little bit of a visual to understand performance, distribution, how many rows went through. And if I click on my little present dashboard, I've got this update button. So I can just come straight in here, say update it, and that's gonna step through and run all of those cells. So it's actually running my Spark query, doing everything massively in parallel. It's actually fairly decent little quick viz engine baked into it, just as part of the Jupyter Notebook stuff. So yes, it's not a fancy interactive Power BI thing, but it's pretty cool. All right. Thank you guys. Oh, that's so nice. That's so nice, thank you. Look, we're really thrilled. Uh, we thought that maybe we would have a couple of our friends that we know would be in the room and nobody else would show up and we were just gonna make fun <laughs> of each other the whole time, but uh, we're really grateful for your time. And we're gonna stay here. He's gotta go to his yep. session, like I told you, so he's gonna dart out rudely. But uh, uh, we love him and we're grateful for him. Data and Engineer Toolkit, TCC, Tahoma yeah, 4. Yeah. Go so check doing, it out, we'll be there sometime soon. The one I'm about to do is a fairly, fairly lightweight intro to Kind of what is Data Factory? What is Databricks? What is Logic Apps? The demo for Databricks might look slightly familiar to uh, the uh, Data Factory one we had. Uh, I might be slightly mean about SSIS. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, and then we'll stay here if you have questions. If you guys want to come up and have questions, thanks.